Currently we're studying the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 19. Last week we read through chapter 18 without making a lot of comments on it. We made a few, but the chapter speaks for itself and we made a lot of comments about what was in chapter 18 when we were in chapter 17. So basically we just read through that. We begin um, an outline on chapter 19 that we gave you and um, in that outline the sections are verses 1 through 6, verses 7 through 9, and then verse 10, and then verses 11 through 16, and then 17 through the end of the chapter is basically the outline of that. We studied verses 1 through 6 last week and we also began the section on the marriage of the Lamb at verse 7. Let's start reading those verses again. Verses 7 through 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. By the way, um, when it says, He saith unto me, uh, we find that the one that is speaking is uh, the voice out of the throne in verse 5. There's uh, four and twenty elders and the four beasts there. And uh, a voice comes out from the throne. And this is the voice uh, that is speaking. Um, verse 7, the marriage of the Lamb. The Lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. The church is composed of all that are believers from the resurrection of Jesus Christ until that red arrow right there, the big red arrow, that's the rapture of the church. So from the resurrection of Jesus Christ until the rapture, all that are believers that come to know the Lord during that time are considered the body of Christ or the church of Jesus Christ. It is a special group a very special, unique group with unique promises and a unique future, different from all other believers at other times. Uh, we're not going to get into all those differences, but I just wanted to point out that this is a particular group. It is a finite group. Once the last believer has come to know the Lord and we are taken up, that body, that group, will never grow. It will never expand. It will always be the same finite number that it will be at the rapture. Whereas, okay, Israel and the nations... See, two other groups in eternity future way over here after time ends will continue to expand and grow and get larger. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, verse 7 says, And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. It's not that peace will last forever and ever. But the increase continues. It will grow, expand. It will do what God originally told Adam to do. Remember? Multiply and replenish the earth. If Adam had not sinned and continued to do that, guess what? There wouldn't have been room to stand on the earth because there would be so many people. No death, no disease. No crime, no sin, it would, 
you'd have to go somewhere else. People would have to go somewhere else to continue to multiply. And that's what it's going to be over in eternity after time ends. But the church, the bride of Christ, is unique. It will be complete at the rapture, and we will be with him forever. You remember, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. <coughs> and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. That is, he is speaking to believers during this time here, the church. <clears throat> now, the marriage of the Lamb takes place here, and these verses are about it. it says that his wife hath made herself ready. Uh, I know sometimes uh, in our culture and other cultures, the wife or the bride uh, goes through a lot. You know, the, the, the hair, the nails, the dress. I mean, you know, phew, there's a, I don't want to get into that. But there's a lot that goes on the day of the wedding. Um, fortunately, we don't uh, guys don't have to worry about that because we're not even supposed to be there when all that happens. You're not supposed to see the wife until you know down the aisle and all that type of thing. But anyway, uh, I saw in verse eight a very interesting word. It says, "To her was granted." <clears throat> that she should be arrayed in white linen. Granted, that almost sounds like somebody is giving permission. Do you see that? Granted. It was granted to her that she should get this beautiful, white, fine linen wedding dress. She would be arrayed in that. It was granted to her. Uh, it was granted to her by her, her husband, her, the groom. Remember, Christ died for her. Ephesians 5, it talks about uh, Christ gave himself for the church. It was a picture of the bride and the groom, but he gave himself for the church. So to her was granted that she should have this. And the righteousness is of the saint. Uh, the saints is the fine linen in verse 8. Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, what does God say about our righteousness right now? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. Everything you do is filthy rags. That's what our, I mean, if we're trying to be righteous, if we're trying to earn God's favor, the Bible says forget it. Because in God's sight, what you are doing is like whew, filthy rags. If you're trying to do it to attain something, to earn God's favor. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves... Not what you can do. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So uh, the righteousness here, you'll see, especially in the psalm, the term, the term righteousness. And David refers to it a number of times. And he usually talks about in his psalms, Thy righteousness, God's righteousness, God's righteousness. And so when Abraham believed God, Genesis chapter 15, it was accounted to him or given to him or credited to him for righteousness. God conveys, gives to us his righteousness through faith. See, 
believe. And we are saved today just the same way Abraham was saved. The same way anyone has been saved since Adam. He believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. Faith. And by the way, the fact that he believed God, that's faith. That's faith. And even that is a gift of God. For by grace you are saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. God gives us that faith. So in effect, he is giving us his righteousness so that when the bride stands to be clothed for this wedding in heaven, it says she is clothed with uh, fine linen, clean and white, <clears throat> which is the righteousness of saints. How many of you ever heard that song, When He Shall Come? Remember that song? And it talks about the very last phrase, to walk with Him in white. See? Uh, listen to that song. That's, that's a beautiful song. I don't hear anybody singing it anymore. I played it one time on the piano but, uh, for an altar tour, and I don't think anybody knew what it was. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the bride here is arrayed in white. Today we're going to learn a little bit more about the marriage of the Lamb and our future with Christ, and we will hopefully get to the return of Christ to the earth. We will see that in verse 11. Let's go on now. At the wedding, the wedding takes place in heaven, in the Father's house. And who will be at the wedding? The attendees are listed in Hebrews chapter 12. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. This is a key passage. When I say a key passage, and we have used that term about different things. It's a key passage in this. It's a key passage about that. Well, this is a key passage in the Bible for understanding some prophetic <clears throat> events. And they're the events that happen right around here in this area on our timeline. They happen, these events will happen in heaven uh, up here now. You know, this is a tribulation period. We will be caught up to be with the Lord, so we will be in heaven during the seven years on earth as it goes over here. But the marriage of the Lamb is going to be way just before the second coming. Let's look at who is going to be there. Uh, very, very interesting passage. And I have read a lot of stuff on this passage. And it seems like nobody gives it the importance that it really uh, contains. It says, but ye are coming to Mount Zion. The but there, where it says but, is a referral back to verse 18. Where it says, for ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. That's a mountain that's on earth, see. You're not coming to a mountain on earth that can be touched. But... Verse 22, ye are come unto the Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, by then you begin to understand where this is. It's the presence of God. It's eternity where he dwells. It's where our believing friends when they die will go to be with God. It's where 
Jesus will return to take us who are alive out at the rapture. It's up there. Okay, so this group, we'll look at who the group is later. Uh, the ye are come to Mount Sinai, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Who's up there? To an innumerable company of angels. An innumerable company of angels. Try to number them. You can't number them. Says there, you can't number them. There's too many for us to count. It's like looking up at the stars. Who can count them? I'm sure there was a time when people had, well, there's X number of stars up there. You know, and then somebody invented a telescope or binoculars or something, and they found a few more. Now they've got this Hubble thing, and they found a few more. So you can't number, you cannot number the angels, see. By the way, angels and stars are sometimes interchangeable terms in Scripture. Okay? When, uh, when God created the heavens and the earth, it said the stars and the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay? They, uh, so speaking of the angels, anyway, I can't number the angels. They're there. They're there now. There will be there here. Let's see who else is there. Verse 23. To the general assembly. Well, the general assembly, we would say, well, that's talking about the Old Testament saints. When did they get there? When did the Old Testament saints get there? You see, you see this uh, red arrow over here? That's where Christ was resurrected. That's where he, and when he was resurrected, it said he took captivity captive with him. Those Old Testament saints, along with Christ, are the first fruits, you see, that go to be with him. So when these people come, they see the angels there, they see the general assembly, which is Old Testament saints. Who else is there? Uh, and the church of the firstborn, the church of the, who's the firstborn? Jesus Christ. And who's the church? We are. We are the church. And we will have been there since this red arrow, see? So, when these people come to heaven, they see the angels, they see the Old Testament saints, they see us, the church of the firstborn. I'll put that up there right there. Uh, by the way, uh, the Old Testament saints are also known as witnesses. You remember that uh, faith chapter, Hebrews 11, when it talks about all those Old Testament guys? And then the very next verse in Hebrews 12 says, Seeing that we are accompanied about with so great a cloud of what? Witnesses. Witnesses. See? Whoa! They're up there. Okay, now, the church of the firstborn is the bride of Christ. And look what it says. It's, um, in verse 7 it says, She made herself ready. That's in, back in Revelation. She has made herself ready to walk down the aisle. Well, let's see who else is there. Uh, let's, let's get to another screen. The father of the groom is there. You see that where it says, And to God, the judge of all. That's Jesus' father. The Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, the Father, is there. The Father of the groom. You saw how often he prayed to his Father. He wanted to do the will of his Father. Okay? The Father is there. Let's see who else is going to be there. Um, we got the Father of the groom. And it says, And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Those are tribulation martyrs. The ones that are living during this time all over here, 
and they are killed for the testimony of Jesus Christ. See? It said they cause them this, the spirits of just men, but they're made perfect. You know what perfect is? It's complete. You know what complete is? You know what incomplete is? That's the soul without the body. See? That's a soul who has no house to live in. Right now, you are soul and body. The person that is you lives in that house. And the house is in various stages of disrepair, maybe as we get older. <laughs> but it is our house. So here we got the spirits of just men, but they're made perfect. How are they made perfect? complete with their bodies. That has happened by the time these people get there. And we see the groom. He's called in this in uh, verse 24 of Hebrews 12 to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. The groom. He is when he says the mediator, what does a mediator do? You got somebody over here that's got something against somebody over here, see? And there needs to be a mediator to get the, those two parties together. Well, on one side we have God the Father. On the other side we have sinful man. And there's conflict. Who is able to bring those together? Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. And it said he paid the price with his own blood. These people over here can't get with God because they have a price to pay and they can never pay it. But Jesus Christ did. He paid it. See? So that is, he becomes the mediator. So we've got, uh, we've got the angels, we've got the Old Testament saints, uh, we've got the father of the groom, we've got the tribulation martyrs, which are the just men, we've got the groom. What, what, what do we lack here at a wedding? Mother. Bride. Well, the bride, yeah. <laughs> Well, what about this? Well, we've already had the bride talking earlier on the other screen. What about the mother of the groom? Can't leave her out, can you? <laughs> In Revelation 12, verses 1 through 5, it talks about the woman with the 12 stars and the sun and the moon, and it pictures her as Israel, the 12 stars, uh, being the 12 tribes of Israel. She's mentioned in there, and she is the last to arrive. And she arrives here in verse 22 when it says, Ye, it's talking about Israel. Israel. They are, and you know when the, they, where, where's Israel been all this time? Uh, if we look at our chart over here, Israel is in their land here. However, when the beast uh, comes in and sits in their temple and said, you must worship me, they know that they've been had and they flee to the wilderness. Israel flees to the wilderness. Jesus said, when you see that happen, flee to the wilderness. So Israel is in the wilderness over here. Revelation 12 says they are protected and fed for three and a half years. During this time, they're out there. And God takes care of them just like he took care of them in the wilderness back in Moses' time. Remember they were out there in the wilderness, their shoes 
lasted, their coats lasted, God gave them water, God gave them food, and protected them from the Egyptians and those around as well. Same thing will happen. Something different will happen though. Exodus 20, verse 33, Jesus will appear to them in the wilderness. They're out there. What in the world has happened? Everything is blown up. Our, we had to flee our country. What happened to all those promises that were, were given to us? They are, they begin to study their scriptures. And that's all they can do out there is study their scriptures. And when Jesus appears to them, it says he will plead with them face to face. And what he will say is this. Uh, I am your Messiah. Believe on me. They will look at him. They'll, wow. They'll see the nail prints. They'll see, and you know what? They'll, they'll realize who he is. They will realize our fathers crucified this guy. See? And the whole book of Hebrews, if you read it, is about this. The author of Hebrews, he's writing to who? Hebrews, Hebrews okay, bingo. And he says, don't make the same mistake that your forefathers did when you came out of Egypt. Remember, I told you to go into the land, and you said, we can't do that because they're too big, there are too many, they got fortresses, they got stonewall cities. And so they said, no, we don't believe God can do it. And so he's saying, don't make the same mistake of unbelief that your forefathers made way back there in Moses' time. Except me now. And at that point, they realize who he is. They believe on him. They accept him as their Messiah and their Savior. Now there's always going to be some people that will not accept him. Remember, uh, there are those who will say, we will not have this man to reign over us. And in Ezekiel chapter 20, it says, he will purge out from among them the rebels. Those who will not accept him are purged out, leaving Israel in 100% belief and acceptance in Christ. He gives them a new heart. He gives them His Spirit. He writes the law in their hearts. They are born again in a day, and they are ready, now qualified to take back their land. Except when they, when they ask Christ, they say, wow, we believe this is wonderful. Are we going to get our land back? Are we going to, are, is the kingdom going to start right now? Jesus says, shortly. But there's something, there's some place we got to go first. And all of a sudden they look around and they're in Mount Zion in the city of God in heaven. And they look around and they see the angels. They see the Old Testament saints. They see the church. They see the Father. They see the, 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 the groom and the bride. And they are there for the marriage of the Lamb and the church in heaven. Uh, verse, uh, Exodus 20. Back in Revelation 19 it says in verse 9 blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb 
Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, while the marriage takes place in heaven, boom, the supper will take place on earth. How do we know that? What do you do when you go to a marriage supper? Number one, you have to let your belt out because you've eaten too much, right? <laughs> There's going to be food. There's going to be Diet Coke or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be stuff to drink and all. You know, you know why I know it's going to be on earth? Because when Jesus sat with his disciples in the upper room and had what we refer to as the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper, where he took bread and broke it and gave to them to eat, and then he took the cup, said, this is my blood uh, which is shed for you, and he says, and the fruit of the vine here, I will not drink it again until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. This will take place in the kingdom. See? So between the marriage that takes place, the wedding ceremony and the marriage supper, we're going to have the return of Christ to the earth. Note, the invitations given out are both for both events. <laughs> we invite people today to come to know Christ. All during this time here after we're gone, uh, the gospel will be preached by the 144,000. The two witnesses over here for the last three and a half years, people will be invited. Verse 9, it says, Blessed are those who are called to the supper. The invitees, as spoken here, then will not have uh, already arrived. Who sends out the invitations? Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. See, he's inviting people. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more here. Uh, but I like this. Those called to the marriage supper are blessed or blessed. Did you know that word is used 291 times in the Bible? The word blessed means what? Happy. Blessed. This is something that you don't get. Uh, real happiness if you're not, you know, in Christ. That's where the source of happiness. Anyway, it says they're blessed. They're blessed. Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12, are known as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, where it says, Blessed are the meek. Say, French, one of them is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? The earth. You know what that is? That's over here. That's over here. Everything that talks about blessed in the Beatitudes refers to what those who are blessed will receive that blessing here. That's kingdom stuff, people, in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. If you look at the book of Psalms, how many times does it say the word blessed? Matter of fact, the very first word in the book of Psalms is blessed. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be there, etc., etc. But the first book, word in the book of Psalms is blessed. Blessed. And when you see that word, blessed, 
There are two types of blessings in Scripture. There's spiritual blessings. Paul talks about all the spiritual blessings by being in Christ. Those, uh, those obviously are that we have our sins forgiven. See? That we are passed from death into life. That we are His. But there are physical blessings too. And the physical blessings that you see spoken of in the book of Psalms all refer to this right here. The book of Psalms is a wonderful book. A lot of it talks about Dave, that David has written a lot of that because he was in trouble. <laughs> he was being hounded by the commander-in-chief of the nation of Israel, King Saul. And Saul was trying to kill him. He was chasing him all over the place trying to kill David. And David was crying to the Lord for protection. David was praying to the Lord that he would hide him from this violent, wicked man. Guess what they're going to be doing during this time? Israel, over here. Just like David. David is a type of Israel during the tribulation period. Matter of fact, some of those, uh, he cried, hide me in your pavilion, in your tabernacle, hide me. And, you know, that is very much the same as Petra means stone. And he says, set me upon a stone, the rock of thy <clears throat> salvation. And he put, and that, over here, that's where they're going to be. So the whole book of Psalms, while we can appropriate a lot of stuff from it, to help us in our Christian lives, yes. Doctrinally and specifically, it applies to Israel during the tribulation period. So much scripture is directly aimed at this time here. See? And the book of Psalms is one of them. The general epistles in Scripture, that is, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, part of the book of Revelation, is aimed at these times here during the tribulation period. Did you know Paul's epistles uh, can be misappropriated for that time? Because when he speaks of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, that will not apply to these people over here. Because it will have already happened. See? So you have to rightly divide the word, a necessary thing. Anyway, the book of Psalms and uh, this word blessed Blessed are they that are invited to the marriage supper. And that would be the ones who are invited to come into the kingdom, into this rule and reign of Christ on the earth. It's going to be physical. It's going to be visible. It's going to be political. He will reign on this earth. No longer will man's governments be in charge. That will come to an end right here, right here when he comes back. There are parables that Jesus told about this coming to the supper. Uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. I'm not going to get into them this morning, but jot them down and read them and study them and see how it applies to this event, the marriage supper. Matthew 22, one through, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. You remember that one about the ten virgins? You know, that uh, the, they had the lamps and they said, the, uh, you know, prepare for the bridegroom and five of them had oil 
to take to put in their lamps, but five of them didn't, and they were not allowed in, you see, because they weren't prepared. Uh, Luke, Luke 14 is another account of the same thing where people are invited, people refuse to come, so the, the Lord says, okay, they refuse, go out and find other people. Go out and find people. Bring them in to the supper, you know. Um, so there's a lot of parables about this. Following the marriage. We will get into the details of this next week, but I am just kind of going to give you about what we're talking about. They will leave the Father's house. The marriage takes place in the Father's house. They leave the Father's house. The honeymoon. That's what follows the marriage, right? You go out of the house, the church, wherever you, you know, justice of peace I don't, you know and you go on your honeymoon you know what this is we will rule and reign with Christ okay what could be better than to be in charge and help Christ rule this earth do you know that some of you sitting out here might be in charge of a certain area, certain city. You remember uh, Jesus talked about the talents that he gave to three of his servants and uh, the servant came, uh, when he came back the servant says, well the talent that you gave me I've got ten talents now through investing. And he says, great, you can be ruler over ten cities. And this other uh, guy says, well, you know, your talent has gained five. He says, well, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. You can rule over five cities. And then, you know, the story about the guy who didn't do anything with it, and he, he didn't make the cut. <laughs> we can say that. Anyway, the honeymoon, the residence. The residence where we will live is the New Jerusalem here. And I like this. Everybody knows Psalm 23. What's it say? And I will dwell forever. Okay? Revelation 21, 3. God dwells with us. We will be with Him. Jesus said, in John 14, that where I am, there ye may be also. Great future, if you know the Lord. Bad future, if you don't. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Help us to love it. Help us to study it. Help us to tell people about it. Guide us as we go. In Jesus' name. Amen.